I'm very skeptical about um, whether the Fed actually helps. I think they do more harm than good. I believe in free markets and there's probably no more important price in a free market capitalist economy than the price of capital. So what the Fed calls a neutral rate is what they think, and, and they admit they can't ascertain what it could be because it really would be the market driven rate from my point of view, it would be the rate at which interest rates are neither um, artificial stimulus nor unnecessarily constraining economic growth. It would be up to the people participating in the economy to say, what is the demand and supply for loanable funds? We'll be talking about monetary policy, the future of the Fed, and also what a possible gold standard could look like for America with our next guest, esteemed economist Judy Shelton. Dr. Shelton is currently the senior fellow at the Independent Institute. She was a former economic advisor to Donald Trump and was nominated by President Trump to serve on the Federal Reserve Board. She's also the author of The Money Meltdown, Restoring Order to the Global Currency System, and her upcoming book, Good as Gold, How to Unleash the Power of Sound Money. Dr. Shelton, it's an honor to host you today. Welcome to the David Lynn Report. Thank you very much. And um, I might say I was, I was honored to be nominated by President Trump to serve on the board of the Federal Reserve. And really appreciated their strong and steadfast support from his administration. Uh, well, let's start with that. Uh, in 2019, I believe, was your nomination to be on the board. Uh, if you suppose you had joined, what would you have done differently over the last three years? I think I would have been warning about inflation sooner because I think that the sort of in inflation we experienced um, was already showing up by mid 2021. And um, uh, I was writing about that for the Wall Street Journal. Um, the uh, cost of housing was really going up. And um, even as, as many people in Congress thought that it was great what the Fed was doing, and, and we could all appreciate that they had to deploy the, the um, um, the shock absorbers. They had to. They had to do what was necessary in the immediate emergency of COVID. That they were. They were staying with those sort of accommodative monetary conditions, and that, in combination with all the fiscal stimulus, was going to result in inflation. So I think I would have been, would have been warning a lot sooner. And uh, it really wasn't until March of 2022 that the Fed even stopped purchasing government securities and mortgage-backed securities, and even began to consider raising rates. Do you believe that the 9.1% inflation that we saw, which was the peak, would not have happened had the Fed raised rates sooner? I, I think it would not have happened, but the main thing, it would have started calling attention to the fact that inflation was a risk. Um, I wouldn't have gone as high as the Fed. Um, I would have stopped raising at about four and a half. So um, I think they then overcorrected. But I think that the market, the market actually likes interest rates to mean something. That is, zero rates are not healthy for productive economic growth. So I think you want a certain, um, certain level of normalization so that banks and investors can, can actually see a trade-off on risk and reward, and it means something. If everybody's paying zero rates, then it's really hard to differentiate the worthwhile projects. So I think that it was actually positive to, to move up to some level of um, above zero, certainly. And probably two and a half would be a nice neutral rate. But of course, nobody is smart enough to know that. The Fed is not omniscient. But, but that has been the real rate of interest for for generations. That seems to be a real rate. For the Fed to then add another 2% to that because their nominal rate has to be boosted up by the target rate of 2%, that still puts it at about four and a half. So I would have stopped at that point. So those are some of the things that have done differently. I recall in 2021 and as well as into last year, 
uh, all throughout 2022 into last year. The debate was how high the rates should have gone. One of the arguments is that the interest rate should be at least the level of inflation rate and perhaps even higher, which, as you recall, is what Paul Barker did in the early 80s. Uh, that proved to, I guess, not be necessary. What are your views on the level of interest rate in relation to the interest rate at any given time? Well, um, I don't think it should be restrictive or, or meant to provide stimulus. I'm very skeptical about um, whether the Fed actually helps. I think they do more harm than good. I believe in free markets, and there's probably no more important price in a free market capitalist economy than the price of capital. So what the Fed calls a neutral rate is what they think, and, and they admit they can't ascertain what it could be because it really would be the market-driven rate from my point of view. It would be the rate at which interest rates are neither um, artificial stimulus nor unnecessarily constraining economic growth. It would be up to the people participating in the economy to say, what is the demand and supply for loanable funds? And I think they're in a much better position to judge whether the amount of money and credit in the hands of people who are part of that economy is appropriate or not. So let them be the ones who control the money supply and um, interest rate is just one measure of that demand and supply for money. I, I would let it be dictated by price signals and market forces rather than um, the uh, 12 voting members of the Federal Open Market Committee, the, the monetary policy making committee of the Federal Reserve. Just, just to clarify to the audience exactly what you mean by by what you just said here, Dr. Shelton, are you suggesting that the Fed's dual mandate of controlling inflation and maximizing employment are really not necessary as a government mandate? These these variables, if you want to call them that, should really be determined by the free market alone? Well, the Fed even admits that um, maximizing employment is, is beyond its, its capability. The, the Fed says that employment is actually um, um, determined by structural factors. So in, in a way, that, that's why you never see metrics. The, the Fed isn't able to accurately say what should be the, the rate of unemployment, um, even though they had their own ideas about that, and that has caused them to make mistakes. For example, the Fed, in 2018 and 2019 um, thought that unemployment had gotten down to impossible lows. Now this was after the Fed had raised uh, seven times after President Trump came into office. Here they hadn't gone it for seven years from 2008. They didn't raise rates, they were zero. They finally raised 25 basis points in December of 2015. They waited another year and then finally crept up in December of 2016, another 25 basis points. Trump came in and in early January, he's now in the White House, Janet Yellen raised another three times in 2017. And then in 2018, Powell came in, he raised another four times. No wonder I think the president, um, it was beginning to express his unhappiness, he said, I'm, I'm launching a pro-growth program of lower taxes, uh, less regulation, we're, we're unleashing energy development, and now we're getting this record low unemployment, which is, is bringing in groups that had never participated before at those levels. Uh, it was like 3.5%. And so it was kind of a, a sharing of, of prosperity across a broader spectrum of society than we had experienced. And the Fed then said, no, no, we have to raise rates preemptively to cut off growth. The irony is that inflation was under the 2% target at that time. And so then we got into this silly exercise where, where the jawboning, which President Trump acknowledges he did, he says, I know I put pressure on the Fed, uh, it turned out that by the latter half of 2019, there were many members on the 
the Board of Governors who had come around to agree with the Trump assessment and said rates are too high. It was hurting manufacturing. It, these were unnecessarily high borrowing costs. And they ended up taking back three of those last four interest rate hikes. And then I think the Fed was concerned it would look like they had caved in. And there was even some thought at the time that they might not reduce rates, even if they thought it was the best course of action for the economy, lest it appear to, to seem like they had been pressured or had caved to that pressure. And that would be the silliest thing of all. Um, it's really important that the monetary policy be appropriate. And while it was unusual that, that a president would express displeasure with monetary policy, it's certainly not the first time that presidents have, have disagreed with what the Fed's doing. It's just they usually go behind closed doors to express it. I do want to come back to that very important point, um, the relationship between the White House and the Federal Reserve. Uh, you've been critical of the Fed's balance sheet and actually their income statement. Reuters reported uh, earlier this month, actually just a few days ago, that um, the Fed lost money in 2023. So I'll just read you a paragraph. The Fed income after expenses came in at a negative $114.3 billion last year versus $58.8 billion in positive income the year before. The loss was tied to a jump in interest expenses faced by the central bank amid a rate hike campaign aimed at cooling inflation. On Twitter, X, you posted a long tweet, which I'll show on the screen for the audience later. Uh, but more or less, you've been uh, critical of this exact same thing. And you've called out the fact that the shrinking portfolio um, has had to pay out some $4.5 trillion in commercial bank reserve balances and reverse repo operations. Under what scenario is this happening, Dr. Shelton? And what are the implications of the shrinking balance sheet? Well, let, let's go to that, that issue of the Fed's operating loss and why that's so significant, I think for many reasons, including that the Fed on its own website points out that one reason it considers itself an independent government agency and behaves accordingly is because it doesn't go to Congress to appropriate funds for operations. And it's always been the case that the Fed earned much more on its own portfolio holdings because the Fed used to use as its primary tool of monetary policy, open market operations. So that just meant that the Fed would buy and sell treasury securities to try to influence the overnight rate at which banks borrowed from each other to meet the reserve requirement. Well, in 2008, as part of the emergency package that then Chairman Ben Bernanke was able to negotiate with Congress, uh, the Fed was given the right to pay interest on reserves. Now, they didn't do that for many years, but the idea was at the same time, the Fed was going to launch another experiment, which was quantitative easing, which the Fed always just called large scale asset purchases, meaning they were buying trillions in government, treasuries, and mortgage-backed securities guaranteed by government agencies. And as they did that, the whole idea was, I mean, the Fed was able to create money. The Fed would, would say to a bank wanting to sell uh, treasuries, um, okay, we just bought those. We now own them in our portfolio. We're going to collect the interest from now on. And we just credited your cash account, which banks are required to keep at the Federal Reserve. We just credited your checking account at the Fed for the amount of the purchase. And so that's why the Fed accumulated a huge portfolio and it was making money off of that because it was earning the interest um, for 10 years prior to the Fed now running an operating loss, the Fed was returning almost a hundred billion a year to the federal budget because the Fed would use a, the smallest fraction, the less than 10% of the earnings from its portfolio to cover its own administrative costs. And then it would give the rest back to the treasury. It's called remittances from the Fed. And if you looked at the budget statements, the federal budget for those years, it counted remittances from the Fed as revenue to the federal budget. So over a trillion in that prior decade. But then 
when the Fed started increasing interest rates starting in March of 2022, it, it had paid some, some balance. It got up to about 2.4% was the maximum amount the Fed was paying banks on their cash holdings prior to COVID. And then they went back to zero. And then we saw once inflation, inflation hit, then they, I think, overreacted and ratcheted up 500 basis points. So now that makes it very, very expensive to be paying these banks. And because they also had purchased so many securities from the banks, the banks had four trillion in reserves that the Fed's now paying that high rate of interest on cash holdings, a riskless government investment by the banks because they invested, that is, they leave that cash at the Fed collecting this guaranteed income at a very high rate. Plus the Fed opened another facility, reverse repos. That facility was another trillion or so. And that allowed money market mutual funds who didn't have actual deposit accounts at the Fed to likewise park their cash overnight at the Fed. So when the Fed now says we're raising interest rates, they don't do it that old fashioned way that Paul Volcker used. They don't buy and sell um, in what we call open market operations to influence the Fed funds rate because the banks don't need to worry about required reserves. There are no reserve requirements now. So that market is has atrophied. Instead, they do it by raising what they now call administrative rates. And the upper limit is like right now it's 5.4%. They pay banks on the interest on reserve balances. That's the cash banks keep at that 5.4% rate. And then they pay 5.3% to borrow overnight, uh, collateralized by the Fed's own holdings, the cash. So in both cases, it's the Fed paying interest on cash to, again, these money market mutual funds. And so in combination, it's about four and a half trillion. If you do the math, that comes out at the annualized rate at that level, the Fed is paying about 240 billion. Now, some of that is offset. They're still making earnings on their portfolio, but they're losing money. The scandal for me is not just that they're losing money because they make less on their own holdings than they're paying out on the cash to these private parties, these banks and mutual funds. It's that they're paying them at all. What they're really doing is paying them, incentivizing them, almost bribing them not to let that cash go into the economy. So you asked an earlier question, is just raising interest rates the way that you fight inflation I would say no, not so long as the Fed is willing to pay whatever it takes to corral that money and keep it from entering the economy. If banks say, I have a much better deal letting the money sit there and earning free interest than I do in hiring another loan officer and making loans that are unnecessarily risky, that could go bad, that, that's much more expensive. I think the Fed is training banks to engage with the Fed to game these programs, rather than make loans to the private sector, potentially productive loans, they're just playing with the money. And I think that's very, very unhealthy. And then meantime, look at what the fiscal stimulus is doing. Here you have the Fed trying to impose the restrictive rate, but fiscally, they're running a huge stimulus program. It's a classic stimulus program at a time when we're seeing economic growth, high demand, and low unemployment. It just, it's inconsistent. It makes no sense. The only ones who really benefit from that are, well, is the government. They borrow at whatever rate it takes. The government raises the money uh, through debt offerings via treasury auctions, and whatever they end up having to pay to borrow money to fund deficit financing of government projects, they'll pay. But the meantime, those high, those high interest rates are a real barrier, a real obstacle to private borrowers. So you can see it is slowly squeezing out the private sector at the expense of government directed investments. Can the Federal Reserve as an entity ever go bankrupt, Dr. Shelton? In other words, could they, in theory, sustain heavy losses on their interest expenses indefinitely? Um, 
they can they can have heavier and heavier losses. I mean, if they ended up selling off their portfolio like they were originally going to do, pare down their portfolio, and then raise the interest rates, then that the loss that's pure operating loss. Would they go bankrupt? No, because the Fed has special rules. They already have a trillion in losses on the value of those capital holdings, on the value of their portfolio holdings. The same thing that they're now trying to impose extra capital requirements on private sector banks, because they also uh, took a, a mark to market loss on their holdings of treasuries because they were following the Fed's example. So if the Fed had to follow gap rules, generally accepted accounting principles, uh, they would be in big trouble financially, but uh, they exempt themselves from following those rules. The U.S. national debt has just surpassed $34 trillion. The budget deficit is currently at around $1.7 trillion. Do these ballooning figures, Dr. Shelton, have any impact on whether or not the Federal Reserve or even Congress could effectively fight inflation? Well, every time you engage in deficit spending, you're expanding, you're putting money in the hands of people, money that's being borrowed from the future. So I think that's the much greater risk to uh, inflation and to the, the future financial viability of the country. Um, you mentioned Volcker. One thing about Paul Volcker is he did not shrink from saying to Congress, you have to try to balance the budget. That's the emergency right now. Volcker was worried about that when, um, when Ronald Reagan came in, in 1981. And Reagan also believed in a pro-growth program. He wanted to spur higher revenues by increasing productivity and, and, and end up having more profits to private parties, to corporations and small business and individuals. And so he also, he wanted a low tax, lighter regulatory burden on the private sector. He wanted to unleash energy, a similar program in many ways to what was launched by the Trump administration, but also part of his program was stable money. And Volcker did not disavow that program. He appeared before um, the Senate Banking Committee within weeks after Reagan was inaugurated. And he said, we do need to give the right tax incentives so that people save and invest. We do need to get the economy growing, but we should not forget the reason we need it to grow is to conquer these, these budget deficits going far into the future. Now, under, under Chair Powell, he makes it known he will not criticize Congress. He says, we take fiscal policy as given. And the problem with that is it's, it's very easy to see that the Fed could go to, let's say they went to 10% as their, their target interest rate um, because they, inflation, let's say, started back up because maybe inflation could be started if an administration said, we're going to start giving universal basic income to everybody. Let's say two thirds of, of, of Americans are going to get $10,000 a week. I mean, I'm exaggerating for purposes of saying it's clear that no matter how restrictive the Fed might try to be by imposing high interest rates, it can easily be overwhelmed by the impact of fiscal measures that put money in people's pockets. It's, it was during COVID when transfers were being provided when, when unemployment benefits were increased for people who weren't working, albeit for the reason of dealing with the pandemic. But some of that has continued to stay with us. And uh, we haven't addressed the fact that now we're still, we've gotten back to work, but there are still fiscal payments and transfers that I think are, are out of kilter. And, and it turned into a convenient thing where the Fed doesn't criticize Congress, even though the Fed would probably like to say it makes our job easier if you don't pay people not to work. And Congress doesn't criticize the Fed in the name of, of central bank independence, even though I'm sure Congress is thinking it would be better for the economy if you didn't pay banks not to make loans.
just for the record, I'm Canadian. But if you guys down there ever give ten thousand dollars a week to two thirds of the population, I'll sign me up. I'm getting my immigration immigration papers in order. <laughs> Although at that point, I suspect a loaf of bread will be a hundred bucks. But anyway, um, I like yes. <laughs> well, yeah, there's uh, that. <laughs> yeah, there's that. I want to move on to uh, the gold standard and. Uh, your outlook for the economy. First, your outlook on the economy. Two-part question, Dr. Shelton. First, do you think we are going to get a recession, yes or no? And given your outlook on the economy, what should the fiscal priority be of the next administration, whether it be a Trump or Biden win? Well, I, I don't think it's helpful to try to predict a recession, but I will say this. I never did. I think I was unusual in saying I, I did not see that a recession had to happen because I think this is the message. This is what we should have learned in 2018 and 2019. Low unemployment is not inherently inflationary. It's not inflationary to have people working to increase supply, to expand output. That's how you bring demand and supply back into equilibrium. That is how you should fight inflation. Not by trying to restrict demand, but by trying to enhance supply. So in a way, what the Fed does is exactly the opposite. By raising borrowing costs, you have entrepreneurs and small business people who maybe see prices going up and their reaction is, I can make money if I can expand plant and equipment. If I can increase my own output, I can sell into those higher prices. That's how it's supposed to work. But um I think the Fed has been fixated on demand instead of supply. And so inflation, to some extent, has come down in, in spite of the Fed raising interest rates. But now I'm afraid if, it start, if inflation starts to go back up, they will double down and start to, to raise more. I don't think a recession has to come unless the Fed induces it by doubling down on unnecessarily restricting growth through these interest rates that they say are meant to constrain economic activity. That's the wrong way to fight inflation. And the second part of the question, fiscal priorities, what should Congress do post November 2024 in terms of taxes, in terms of budgeting, in terms of spending, things that they should prioritize to shore up the economy, Dr. Shelton? Um, well, I certainly think that they should reduce spending, but the key has has always been increasing revenue. And we saw that a pro-growth program uh, did bring about record levels of revenue, but what happened is, is that the White House under Biden and a complicit Congress increased the spending more than the revenue. So I still emphasize growth, but what you need is, I, I believe in cutting taxes and reducing the regulatory burden. So I, if you reduce tax rates, to me, you're unleashing the future profits, the future productivity, future output that will generate the revenue, and you end up with a greater harvest. And so it turns out it's kind of an investment in the future. If you just are redistributing current consumption, you're running a deficit for that reason, then you're just borrowing from the future and paying it out of revenues that have yet to, to have been realized. So I, I, when people think, oh, well, how can you reduce taxes when you're wrestling with the budget deficit? If you're doing it for the right reason, and we've seen, we have every reason to believe, every expectation that when you give the incentives to save and invest, and to produce, it pays off and you do get the higher revenues. I also think that though it's not an immediate issue of finance or economics, but if you unleash energy, that's gonna have a huge impact, I think on future revenues, a big portion of which always go through the government. And I think that would be very helpful. And at the same time, if you just become much more efficient about expenditures and particularly those transfer payments where you're discouraging people from participating in employment. I think we really need to reevaluate to what extent um, people are able to avoid <laughs> having to work for a living. And I believe in having a cushion. I believe in a safety net. 
but I also have been impressed by work by Senator Phil Graham showing that it's possible for people to take advantage of everything from food stamps and housing sub subsidies and other government transfer programs and, and enjoy a life that is equivalent to an $80,000 job that maybe their neighbor is working very hard, putting in long hours, and uh, they end up having to pay taxes on their salary, whereas someone can take advantage of government programs uh, tax-free and not have to work. That's not fair. Uh, Dr. Shelton, do you believe, or is there any evidence to suggest that perhaps the Federal Reserve is under pressure by the current administration to reduce interest rates into the election year? Well, um, overtly, um, President Biden had had been very careful, always saying we believe in an independent Federal Reserve. But um, after the last uh, CPI number came in, well, no, the one before that, he had a little bit of a slip and said, we're very happy with that, with the jobs report and the um, seeming reduction in inflation at that point, because then the Fed won't feel compelled to raise rates. Now that could be taken if, if the Fed's ears are burning as a little bit of instruction. I think the Fed risks looking political. I find it kind of laughable that if they people treat it a little sanctimoniously, the independence um, the Fed's web website explains, for example, as part of its independence, that elected officials um, or people from the administration can't serve on the board of the Federal Reserve. But it's clear that the former chair of the Fed and the former vice chair of the Fed can serve in the administration because Janet Yellen is the most important member of the cabinet with respect to economics and finance. And Lael Brainerd is the head of the National Economic Council, which is housed in the White House, which directly informs the president about the political implications of all of its economic policies. So um, I don't think those two individuals became Democrats only when they walked out of the door of the Fed. Um, there's also been a recent study that there are 10 times as many registered Democrats among the Fed's army of PhD economists. They have uh, over 500. There are 10 times as many Democrats as Republicans among that group of Fed economists. And I, I'm not saying that there isn't an effort to be made to be bipartisan or better nonpartisan, nonpartisan, but I think that people are human and, um, and so a certain ethos permeates the Fed. That may be why the Fed started to be a little more vocal about needing to be involved in climate change is issues. That's why the Fed sometimes seemed to be discouraging banks from making loans uh, connected with fossil fuels or even, even restricting loans to companies that manufactured um, guns or ammunition. It's not really the Fed's job to put that kind of pressure, which might be considered more of a political agenda than a matter of uh, what makes sense economically or financially from a bank point of view. But banks are very sensitive to how the Fed evaluates them because the Fed is also their chief regulator. So banks don't want to deal crosswise of the Federal Reserve or the examiners who come in to give their opinion of the status of that particular bank. Uh, finally, let's talk about the gold standard. Uh, Dr. Shelton, you've been very vocal uh, in your career to ha have pushed the idea of a return to the gold standard for the U.S. This has been widely covered by many, many media outlets throughout your career. Uh, let's back up a minute and talk about why you think this may have been necessary or whether or not it, you, th you still think it could be beneficial. Well, I think my, my views have, were kind of misrepresented. Um, as, as an academic, I it was part of my professional duty, I think, to examine prior international monetary systems in particular um, that that have been in place over over different periods of time. 
and uh, and and I tended to look at the classical international gold standard because when the country came into being, uh, Thomas Jefferson took on the duty of establishing a money unit for the United States, and in those days, gold and silver were were the currency, and they had intrinsic value, and it was a matter of of standardizing um, what would be the weight and purity. Um, and so the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, I believe, is when Congress was granted the power to say, what will be, how do we regulate the money? It's in the same sentence as, as where Congress has granted the power to define the weights and measures for the nation, because money was meant to be a standard. It was meant to be a measure. And so um, it was Jefferson in a 17 page essay um, who said, well, let's decide what's important. Money should be something familiar to people. Let's decide what our unit is. Let's see what's available. It should be understandable, should be straightforward and simple. The United States under his advice was the first country to use a decimal system for their money instead of shillings and pence and all these complicated ways. He said money should work for the people because it was kind of part of the founding principles. You would empower people. They were gonna be self-governing. They would have economic liberty along with other freedoms so they could pursue life, liberty and happiness. But having money they could count on was not only a way to set up a, a stable foundation for that kind of activity by individuals. It was also a way to unite these newly independent um, 13 colonies that were now states. So we're looking at the era that, that the constitutional definition of, of Congress overseeing the money came into being. And by, well, much later, we had to get through the Civil War and we had lots of concerns over gold and silver, but by 1880, the whole world was effectively on an international gold standard and it worked quite well. And, and you can ask people like Alan Greenspan, he thought it worked very well and he was always a strong proponent. I think we can learn from it. I, I don't think I'm suggesting and never have that we're going on it. I mean, by that, you have to define what you mean by a gold standard. We have um, at over 2 trillion in just federal banknotes. That's just the cash right. that the, between um, the Fed authorizing and then what the mint produces from coinage but about 70% of that even circulates outside the, the borders of the United States. The amount of gold the United States government holds is about a half trillion. You marked it to market. We carry it at about $42 an ounce. So it's worth over 2000. But right there, you see the math. If people think a gold standard means that every, every paper dollar can be traded in for gold, well, already you'd have to more than quadruple um, the, the values to make it work out. It's, that's, that's not what I'm suggesting, and, and I haven't. What I've said is what we need to learn from these prior systems is what works and what doesn't. And one thing good about the gold standard, the classical version, was it was self-correcting and it was organic. Um, interest rates weren't dictated by a central bank. They weren't imposed. People loaned or borrowed money at, at whatever rates they, they could get. And that depended on the demand and supply for, the, for capital. So having redeemable paper claims just gave you a sense of security that the money was going to function as a viable unit of account. Um, certainly it was what you used to carry out your transactions, but it was also a store of value because there was this redeemability factor. And that was that was very important. We lost some of that. Well, the gold standard was defeated by World War One. And it wasn't until we got through the 30s, which were a mess, an unanchored period with countries devaluing the currencies left and right. It was a race to the bottom. International trade collapsed. That probably set the stage for World War Two. Um, as World War II was coming to an end, the Bretton Woods system was put into place. It was also based on a gold anchor. It's just that only the dollar would be convertible into gold. Not every country had to be responsible for their currency. Only the dollar 
could be converted $35 for an ounce of gold. And then other countries, what they had to do is maintain a stable exchange rate between their currency and the dollar. And if someone wanted to redeem, it couldn't be you or, you or I, as we could under the international, the classical gold standard, under the Bretton Woods system, only foreign central governments, foreign central banks could trade in what they considered excess dollars. If they said, I think that there's too many dollars relative to the amount of gold, we'll, we'd rather have the gold, they could trade them in and did trade them in. And we saw our gold reserves going out right up until um, President Nixon closed the gold window, thinking that he might change the convertibility rate. And after about a year and a half of trying to maybe go make it higher than $35 per ounce of gold, he got up to 42. And by then they said, we can't catch up. We're going to floating rates and we have no anchor after that. Dr. Dr. Chen, let me just close on this question. Suppose you had your way and you could create your ideal version of a gold standard. Suppose that version were to be implemented this year or next year. What exactly would that look like? Are we talking about a fixed exchange rate, uh, U.S. pegged to gold and vice versa? Uh, are we talking about something else? And more importantly, for the viewers watching this show right now, how would their lives be impacted and changed by this gold standard? I would like to do something very concrete. That would be um, the exercise of leadership by the United States as the issuer of the dominant global reserve currency. I would like to, uh, I guess I could say, make America's money great again. Nixon took us off the, um, the Bretton Woods system, which was the last tie to gold. President Reagan talked about restoring some kind of link, he said, some kind of link so that the US dollar would be seen as the most trustworthy currency in the world. What I think we truly could do goes back to those same gold reserves I mentioned earlier in your program. We have 261 million ounces, more than any other nation in the world, of gold that's held by the treasury. Uh, the Fed carries it on the books at being worth 11 billion. But as I said, it's worth at least half a trillion. I think to acknowledge, let's say in 2026, under the next presidential administration, to acknowledge that 50 years into the future, let's say by the 300th anniversary of the founding of the United States, the United States is going to continue to be the leader and going to be stronger than ever and will have, will have confronted its fiscal budgetary challenges. And so I would authorize, I would have the treasury issue a gold convertible 50 year bond, a government treasury offering. And people who would care to purchase that bond would have effectively this, this deal. This instrument would give them the right on the date of maturity to either have the face value of the bond, which let's say should be the price of gold plus 2% inflation since that's the promised target rate that the Fed stipulates. I would prefer zero, but let's just say we'll hold the Fed to their promise and we will hold treasury to being fiscally responsible. If they say they can deliver 2% inflation, then let's, let's make that a promise and say, at the end of 50 years, that face value will be the equivalent of the price of gold the day it's sold plus 2% inflation over that period. And the bondholder will have the option to either take the gold or the dollars. I think like a TIPS bond, a TIPS bond, a treasury um, uh, inflation security protected instrument issued by our government now, which is a large class, treasury bond offerings. There's a, a lot of investors like a TIPS bond because then they don't worry about inflation. They get compensated afterward for the inflation. They can really just look at the real interest rate on the bond, not knowing it won't be undermined by a decrease in their purchasing power. This sort of, I call them a treasury trust bond. I think maybe grandparents would buy it for their grandkids. 
But maybe investors would say this is a way to have a barometer of the credibility of the Federal Reserve and, and the people in charge of the fiscal budget to see if they really are going to behave responsibly and then see what the rate on that instrument, how it looks relative to conventional treasury offerings in the same way people get an estimate of aggregate expectations of inflation by comparing TIPS bond yields with regular treasury bond yields. If you look at, at the yield on this instrument, A, it would be a very cheap way for the government to borrow and they'd get a windfall profit, I think, of on the uh, gold holdings automatically. And they would also lock them up for 50 years. So no one gets a bright idea of just selling them off and wasting the money and more government spending. But that is a real initiative that might be replicated privately. You might see people, investment companies saying, if there's demand for that, investment demand, then why don't we put together gold futures with treasury offerings and, and give something similar? I mean, it could end up having a very real impact. The important thing is, the president who does that will be the first president to put the U.S. back on some kind of a, a goal connection to the dollar. And I think that would be a monumental act of leadership. And it could be the beginning. Maybe other countries would do the same. That's what I can imagine. Maybe other countries would do the same. And if they did, now you're talking about stable exchange rates in the future, because if they're all pegging not pegging, that's the wrong word. If they're all actually guaranteeing convertibility and saying we're setting aside this collateral to back this treasury sovereign debt instrument, and if they were all going to mature in the same day, just imagine they would effectively be interchangeable because they would all be claims to the same thing. The uh, reference point, it, the common denominator would be gold would be the collateral at a fixed rate because they would have had to put an actual nominal amount of their own local currency as the face value on that bond. I think it could be very interesting and even a tool for the Fed to anticipate how people are viewing future exchange rates and the viability of the promise to maintain 2% inflation and no more. I, I know I've already kept you over time and I do appreciate your time today. Thank you very much, Dr. Sheldon. My audience would probably, well, not probably, but most likely want you to answer my last question for you today, which is, do you think that the U.S. dollar is losing its hegemony as the sole global reserve currency? You brought this up as a dollar, as a global reserve currency. Is it losing its status, Dr. Shelton? There's been a slight deterioration. Um, I think it's important that we never take it for granted. It We shouldn't just be the best of the worst. I think it, this is a chance, the whole world is drowning in government debt. And I think that has undermined the viability of currencies. It hurts trade because when the terms of trade are changed by currency manipulation, all of those, those unfair trade practices are enhanced when the currencies are constantly gyrating and central banks are, are playing a big role by, by one offering an interest rate and, and another offering a different interest rate. And people can arbitrage that and game it. And none of that to me is very productive. If you had a rational system, then, then investment would go into real projects. So I think the US dollar needs to be solid. And I think this proposal I just outlined would be a way of saying our goal is to maintain the integrity of US money and, and have the dollar be a solid claim to real value. Thank you very much. So you're the author of The Money Meltdown, Restoring Order to the Global Currency System. We'll put a link to the book down below. You have an upcoming book that people should be uh, aware of that's um, gonna come out, I believe, later this year or next year, you told me. Good as Gold, How to Unleash the Power of Sound Money. So we'll, 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 we'll make a note of that. Uh, where else can we follow your work, Dr. Shelton? Well, I've been very grateful to the Independent Institute. They have um, put all my writings together and, uh, and they'll be publishing the book um, this summer. Um, I've been lucky, fortunate that um, my essays um, have made their way into the Wall Street Journal. They've, they've been great about um, providing that platform. So I just um, am trying to, to get my views out there for anyone interested. And um, I even appreciate 
your inviting me to do this segment because I think this has been um, a very good way to go a little bit more in depth. I appreciate you giving me the chance to elaborate on some of these points. Yeah, especially since um, we can get to hear your views from the horse's mouth, so to speak, and not get confused <laughs> by other people reporting on your views. So thank you very much. We appreciate you sharing your pleasure. views directly. Thank you, thank you for Absolutely. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to follow Dr. Shelton. The link's down below. And we'll see you next time.